guys, it's Dr. Becker again. Today we're gonna to talk about uh, your nose and sinuses. It's a pretty important topic since millions of Americans suffer with uh, sinus and nose problems um, every year. So uh, I'm gonna, in this video, uh, do a little introduction to the nose and sinuses. I really wanna talk about the difference between the nose and sinuses because I think um, we, use the words sort of interchangeably uh, and say like, oh, I have sinus problems when sometimes we have nose problems. So I wanna make it, I'm gonna teach about that distinction and um, I wanna talk about uh, nasal, a little bit about nasal anatomy and also function. And then that is gonna segue into um, how ENTs think about taking care of the sinuses and some of my recommendations for long-term um, you know, maintenance and care to reduce your symptoms and problems. And also a little note about sinus pain uh, on the side, because that's also something that afflicts a lot of people uh, and may not always be adequately treated. So um, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So hopefully uh, that'll be interesting to you and informative. So we'll, get, we'll just get started. Um, first of all, I like to explain to people that your nose is the uh, you know, everyone thinks I know what my nose is. It's right here, right? But your nose is the space in your sinonasal area that you actually breathe through. So the point of your nose is to filter and humidify the air that you breathe and, um, and also to smell, right? Um, and the nose you can think of like, um, you can think of it like a hallway where the front door is your nostril and the back door is the top of your throat where the air goes in you know, into your lungs when you breathe in. So the nose is like this hallway and along the walls of the hallway, there's a lining and the lining is active. It's alive. It uh, creates mucus and it has little tiny cellular hairs, not, not real hairs, right? But like cellular hairs called cilia that, that actually move, they actually beat the mucus like a little algae bed, but they're, they're alive and they're active. They beat the mucus, they move the mucus through your nose, toward your throat, and down your throat. And the purpose of this, we call that mucociliary function. The purpose of all of this is that when we breathe, there's all sorts of particles and little motes of whatever in the air, and they stick to the mucus like flypaper, and then our body is constantly cleaning the mucus and, and putting it down our throat for us to swallow and then digest. Okay, so this is literally happening right now in my nose, in your nose, in everybody's nose, and we're pretty much unaware of it, okay? So I, I think it's interesting too that a, really a lot of people come and say, well, I have post-nasal drip, I have mucus that goes down my throat. Um, and obviously those people are more aware of it or it's bothering them, but the fact is like, we all have post-nasal drip literally all the time. The nose makes up to a quart of mucus a day and we digest it and it does not bother us. It doesn't make us nauseous or ill. It doesn't put mucus in our, in our stool or anything like that. It's just literally part of like daily bodily function. So that's really interesting and it's important to know uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about you know, how to keep our nose and our sinuses healthy later on in this video. So that's what our nose does. It just filters air cleans the air, sends the mucus down our throat for us to digest, to recycle all those, you know, any nutrients in the mucus, but then just to like poop out like pieces of dirt or whatever that we actually dentally inhaled. And the, you know, and then of course, uh, you know, the smell molecules will come up and hit our, what's called our olfactory neurons up here and they will detect, they will detect, you know, our, you know, anything, any odors in the air that we're breathing. So then if that's what the nose does and is just a hallway that goes from here to here, then what are our sinuses? So that is an interesting question, right? So our sinuses are actually air-filled spaces, to use the building analogy, they're like rooms that are connected to the hallway by little doors. So these rooms, you have several sets of sinuses. You have one in your cheeks here, called your maxillary sinus. You have frontal sinuses that go you know, right up a little bit into your forehead. You have a kind of a honeycomb cascade of, of sinuses between your eyes called your ethmoids. It's almost like a bee, like a honeycomb that goes back uh, on sort of on top of where you breathe. And then you have a deep sinus called your sphenoid way, way, way in the back. 
And they, they just literally, people say, well, what, what do they do? And I go, you know, I, I, they actually don't do anything. Uh, in, in, in a normal situation, they, they just sit there and they do have a mucous membrane lining and they're, they just kind of, you know, keep house. They normally just like make really thin mucus, very thin, and they make this layer and the little cilia in there, move the mucus to the nose. And again, they throw out, you know, the trash, whatever trash they have every day in a constant basis. And then it all goes with the rest of the mucus down the throat. So they don't actually, as far as we know, like do much, but we think that, you know, there's some theories about why we have them. One is that our head would be so heavy if we didn't develop air spaces in our giant heads. Another would be that it helps us resonate our voice, that it was developed, um, you know, for that reason, uh, um, evolutionarily, you know, the voice people like that one. Um, some think it's maybe like a crumple zone for our face. So if we have a trauma, we walk into a tree or something, we might break our cheekbones and crush the sinus a little, but at least it protects our brain. So those are some theories. Well, we don't really know if any of them or all of them are right. But the point is the sinuses don't, they don't, they're not part of our breathing. They don't impact our sense of smell. I mean, indirectly they can, but they don't actually aren't responsible for us smelling. And, and they kind of just, you know, they kind of just sit there and can sometimes get into trouble. So that's the difference between the nose and sinuses. Um, I'll show you a little diagram really quick of uh, the nasal anatomy, just so you can get a sense of what we're talking about. So here's a little diagram of uh, kind of what I was talking about, about the inside of our nose here, where the air flows, and then the different sinus cavities that exist in our skull underneath the surface. So um, I'm just gonna, point out one more thing that I like to explain when I'm explaining sinus anatomy, and that is that the first, if you imagine that this is like the hallway that I was talking about, imagine it has several stories. So the first floor here is really where our air flows, um, and it's, it, it's really responsible for all of our, all of the flow of the air back through the nose and into the throat. The second floor here um, is really about where the sinuses drain. So the sinus little, little doorways are up higher in the nose here. And this second floor here is all about, I call it like the sinus zone. It's all really about where the sinuses drain, but we don't have a lot of airflow through that zone. And then the third zone, the third floor up here, way, way, way up high, close to the skull base, is really where we smell. So the smell neurons have to get way up here to these two little jobbies in order to, um, in order to uh, trigger the, the messages that go to our brain. And just to give you a sense for what's going on along the sidewall of the nose when I talked about all these really active tissues, um, this is a picture of what our nose looks like if you were to sort of slice our head in half. And the three, the three zones of the nose are really this inferior zone here, which is uh, has this like sort of this ridge that sticks out called the inferior turbinate. And then the second zone where the sinuses drain has is really has this ridge that sticks out. That's called the middle turbinate. And then our, our superior portion of our nose way, way, way up top here has our superior turbinate. And that's really where the smell neurons are. So when we're talking about clearing out the nose for breathing, we're really talking about this passageway where the air will come in, you know, from the front of the nose here, go through this, and then, you know, as you can see, come to the back of the nose here and then down the throat. So the sinus area and the smell area are not really the part where that's receiving all this airflow. So if you have a stuffy nose, this is the part of the nose that we're working on and not really up here. That's my primer about nasal anatomy. I hope it wasn't too much, but it gets into what I want to talk about later, which is uh, the difference between sort of how ENTs sometimes think about infections in the nose and sinuses and how um, other doctors like primary care doctors might think about it. Um, in ENT, we're, we're really thinking a lot about the structure and function of the nose and sinuses so that if you have problems like stuffy nose or recurring infections, we ask ourselves, what about the structure and function of your nose and sinuses is not working? We, of course, use antibiotics, for instance, to treat infection, but if patients really struggle with infection and get repeated infections, have an infection that they can't resolve, then we ask ourselves, what can we do about the structure and function of the nose 
to improve that outcome going forward so you're not in a vicious cycle of getting infected. And there's two answers to that, structure and function. So when it comes to structure, if you have a stuffy nose because, for instance, the wall that runs down the middle of your nose is really crooked, either from a trauma or just because it grew that way, it turns out it just grows that way in a lot of people, then we can fix that surgically, make it straight so that there's more room for airflow through that hallway. Additionally, if you have very narrow sinus openings or if they've developed in a way that makes it very difficult for them to do the job of beating the mucus and cleaning themselves, we can make the sinus openings larger so that they tend to not get infected every time you have a little cold or allergy or just like a bad day or something like that. So those are some structural things that ENTs do to sinuses and noses to help them be healthier. It's also really important to understand that structural adjustments may not be the only answer to your problems. You have to think about that mucociliary function that I talked about, that function of keeping everything clean and flowing to pre prevent infection. I'm going to tell you, most people who have problems with their nose and sinuses have some kind of allergy because our job of our nose is to filter the air all the time. All of the pollens and allergens in the air, you know, dust mite, uh, dander or whatever is going to get into our nose and can sometimes cause a reaction. So when our nose is reacting to these things that it thinks is a pathogen, is a dangerous, you know, bacteria, it thinks it's like the enemy is going to launch an attack on these pollens and, and dust mint danders and things like that in our nose. When it does that, it swells up, it makes excessive mucus, it becomes like red and tight inside our nose, it stops doing its homework. It stops taking care of the regular daily chores of keeping the nose clean. It's basically on red alert, sometimes all the time. And when it does that, it really sets up an opportunity for bacteria and even maybe viruses to get into the nose and sinuses and cause infections. So when we're looking to get our noses and our sinuses to not be so stuffy and draining and getting infected and causing headaches all the time, we need to think about the function of the nose and reduce the inflammation and pollen exposures that create the whole problem in the first place. So ENTs are also all about making sure that the nasal membranes are kept clean and without inflammation. Now, I will tell you that the first line therapy that a lot of people turn to for allergies are the pills, the allergy pills that you can get now easily over the counter, like Claritin, Allegra Zyrtec, and their generic equivalents. But a lot of ENTs will find that that is just really not enough to control the nasal inflammation that, need, that leads to a lot of sinonasal problems. So, we really recommend that people get uh, in the habit of using the nasal sprays. So the sprays that were developed in the last couple decades, like Flonies, which is also called Fluticasone, and Nasonex, Nasacort, Rhinocort, um, those are all called intranasal steroids, and they are very safe to use long-term for almost everybody. Um, they will, with regular use, decrease the amount of not just nasal symptoms of stuffiness and draining mucus, but also um, even infections by reducing the inflammation from allergy and allowing the nose to behave in a more normal fashion so it can move mucus along and also ventilate and you know just drain itself like it's supposed to. In addition, you know, we can actually give our noses a break from trying to work against all the allergens by simply washing or rinsing our noses every day. So this is something that's more of a stretch for people, but most ENTs strongly support for people with chronic problems, the use of either a saline spray or even a saline rinse, like a neti pot style, like up one side, out the other side, kind of saline rinse every day or every other day to just hit the reset button on the nose, clean all the mucus out, remove the pollens, so the nose doesn't have to work so hard on doing it itself. So a lot of folks who have a lot of you know, re recurring infection and chronic, you know, who come in and say, I've had sinus for years, do really well with just developing a habit of rinsing their nose 
and spraying their nose with one of these um, you know, allergy type sprays, which are now over the counter. Um, and they, they really just find that with a regular use of that, that they just feel a lot better and have a lot less illness. I will make a side note that I'm not talking about decongestant sprays that come under the brand names like Afrin, Vix has one, uh, Four Way. Um, those are sprays that are not good to use for your nose. They're temporary fixes that last several hours that do not in general help your nose and in fact over uh, long-term use make it worse. We generally recommend avoiding those sprays um, for anything more than like literally one use in a week. Like not even every day, like you should not be using those every day. If you are, you definitely need to see an ENT doctor and address your underlying issues and get you off of those sprays because that will make your nose worse over time. Um, another side note I wanna make is about sinus pain. This is such an interesting topic because millions of Americans suffer with sinus pain, with, with um, sinus headaches and pressure um, that's often like a little bit out of the blue, like not necessarily triggered by, um, you know, getting a cold or allergies or something like that, where they sort of have these episodes where the sinuses feel bad, they feel very stuffy and congested, but might not get the traditional symptoms of sinusitis like green mucus and coughing up green mucus and, you know, weird smells in their nose and things like that. Some of those people, and even sometimes they're mixed together, like you'll have a little infection, but you'll also have like very prominent symptoms of pain and even some other symptoms like nausea or dizziness or feeling foggy headed or lightheaded. Sometimes those, those episodes really, really need to be thought of as a sinus headache, okay? So what I'm making a distinction between is the infection symptoms and the headache symptoms. Now, they often come together, like I said, when people are having a problem with their sinuses, but sometimes they don't. So I have patients who come in with horrible sinus infections and they'll just say like, oh my God, I'm stuffy and I'm snotty and I have pressure and it's disgusting, but they will not have pain. And I have patients who come in exactly the opposite, who say, oh my God, it's killing me. I couldn't even get out of bed. My sinuses were throbbing. I felt congested. I maybe had some clear drainage, but it was not really the same as maybe a sinusitis that they may have experienced in the past. And the reason that this happens is that we have a whole separate thing called sinus headache that really generates like a headache from our brain, but can be triggered by problems with our nose and sinuses, or can be triggered by anything else. It can be triggered by stress or something that you eat or your hormones, especially in females. So it's very important when you have those strong symptoms of pain or pressure, especially if it's accompanied by one night, you know, brain fog or dizziness or nausea to treat it like a headache. You can still look for sinus treatment. You can take your Flonase, do a rinse, uh, you know, even think about, you know, talking to your doctor about antibiotics or steroids if those other symptoms also exist. But do not hesitate to take ibuprofen or aspirin or if you've had a history of migraines, even one of your migraine medicines like Imitrex or Sumatriptan, Take those medicines to help you with the pain symptoms and stop the sinus headache early in its course. It's very important that you understand that in order to get yourself uh, back to better function. So I think, um, I think that's all I was gonna talk about today. Um, I just wanna finish with, um, with a note about um, just making sure that if you have really chronic problems or a sinus problem that's very persistent, that you, um, that you do consider getting in and seeing an ENT to help you sort out uh, you know, the best uh, options for you going forward so that you can make yourself, uh, that you can make yourself better. Um, I'm gonna check my notes. Um, yeah, I think that is everything I did wanna talk about today. Um, I str like I said, I strongly recommend that if you do have sinus problems that you develop um, like a hygiene regimen of maybe rinsing and spraying and helping you to feel better. And, um, and if you're really interested in uh, learning how to do a sinus rinse, you can look at our website at burgerhenryent.com where we have a link to another video that is an instructional video on how to do a saline rinse. And so I encourage you to try that if you've ever been interested, it can be very useful. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.